Hello, how are we doing? Are you doing well? You look good today. Why don't you take your seats? Oh, I love these moments and hate these moments when you get to preach because you are very aware of just how much you cannot do it in your own ability and you need God to move. But I also, you know, you treat them with this trepidation of God. It is your Word. It is just the most holy thing that we can ever receive. It is life-changing. So I need to pray and I need you to join with me because I don't want to just do a message today. I want God to do something on the inside of us that sets us up for freedom, that sets us up for more that He's got for us, that changes something on the inside of us that just frees us up to see in a new way, to hear in a new way. So God, we just ask that You would speak today. God, I know I cannot do this in my own strength and I need You to move. And Father, I pray for Your clarity. I pray that we would have Your ears to hear that whatever is going on in our worlds right now, we would just settle it. And God, we would listen to what You wanna say. God, give us an openness to be changed. God, You say that Your Word pierces to the heart. It divides soul and spirit. It speaks to us. It reveals things to us. And I just pray that You do that right now in the mighty Name of Jesus. Everybody said, Amen. Thank you, incredible team. You are amazing. Well, we are in this whole series at the moment of Unlocking Tomorrow. And today we are going to be focusing on Unlocking Freedom. And I, I, I think it's something that I've always been very passionate about, seeing people live lives of freedom. Like, I don't know about you, but I hate seeing people walk down the street with their head down, insecure, lacking confidence, because that's the total opposite of what God has for us. God has for us a life that is filled with His truth, with His hope and His freedom. So today is all about unlocking freedom and We're actually going to turn to 2 Samuel 6, verse 12 to 23. And it's the story of King David bringing the Ark of the Covenant into uh, Israel. And it says this, wearing a linen ephod, which is pretty much his underwear, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might. And while he and all Israel were bringing up the Ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of trumpets. Just imagine that scene how epic that would have been, such celebration, because the Ark of the Lord, the presence of God was coming back into the city of David. And as the Ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michelle, daughter of Saul, saw from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. Then they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for. And David sacrificed burnt offerings before the Lord. After he'd finished sacrificing all the offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord Almighty. Then he gave a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and cake of raisins to each person, the whole crowd of Israelites, both men and women, and all the people went to their homes. When David returned home to bless his household, Michelle, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today. Going around half naked in full view of the slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. David said to her, it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this and I will be humiliated in my own eyes, but by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honour. And this tragic sentence, and Michelle, daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. What a story. You know, when I was reading this, I read it going, Michelle, why would you do that? Why would you respond to the king of Israel in that way? Like, what caused you to do that? Like, we've got to get our heads right now into a place where the king of Israel, he was esteemed above anyone else. He was treated usually with complete honour. Everything came from him. It was the worst thing she could have possibly done for her future, to talk to the king of Israel in that way. He wasn't just her husband, he was the king of Israel. 
And it's like, what were you thinking, girl? What got into your head? But if you look at the backstory of Michelle, you actually get a little bit more revelation of what was going on in her world internally. So we know in 1 Samuel 18 that when she was a young woman, she was desperately in love with King David. So much so that her father Saul realized it and then said to David, I want you to go out and kill 200 Philistines, the enemy, bring their foreskins back to me as you did back in those days. Bring them back to me. So David fought for her hand in marriage. He loved her right back. But then King Saul started to hate David, get jealous of him, and so wanted to take his life. Michelle found out about it and then set him free. But for seven years, David was on the run from King Saul. And in that time, Michelle was taken and given to another man. And during those seven years that David was separated from her, he got more wives And when he came back after King Saul's death to take on the kingship of Israel, he asked that Michelle be returned to him as his rightful wife. But as she was returned to him, uh, the second husband wept behind her as she was brought to David. So this husband of hers desperately loved her as well. And this time as she was brought to David, she was just the first of many wives. She wasn't the only wife. So through all of this, you can see that Michelle went from a place where she desperately loved David to this passage here where she despised him. So in the space of seven years, something internally had gone on Michelle's world that allowed disappointment to set in. Disappointment over and over again of loving David and then having this other man who loved her, then being separated from him, then coming back into King David's household and just being one of many wives and just feeling like she was an outcast. Disappointment would have set in. But the thing is, the disappointment, she allowed it to get into her soul, to get into her spirit. So it bred this bitterness and this resentment. And as I was reading this, honestly, I felt that God download this message to me in an instant. And it doesn't happen very often that messages like that happen. Usually it's like hours of laboring over God's Word, which I did as well. But in an instant, God downloaded this message and He told me, I want you to teach my people how to deal with disappointment. Because disappointment is just a reality of the life that we live. It is the reality of the world that we live in today. We are going to be disappointed time and time again. COVID has been a great reflection of that. Disappointment time and time again. Businesses closed down. Lockdowns happening. Things happening that we didn't expect. And we can live with disappointment. But the thing is, we are the ones that choose what we do with disappointment. We are the ones that choose how we handle it. See, disappointment handled the wrong way meant for Michelle that she missed out on the blessing that was hers. See, the scripture, this passage says that King David actually came back to bless her, to bless her house, his household, to bless her. She was the first wife that meant she was in line to produce an heir to the throne. She had this future ahead of her that was brilliant, that was God-filled, but because disappointment set in that led to bitterness and resentment, she lost her God purpose. And I feel like the same can happen in us today. When disappointment sets in and it breeds bitterness and resentment in our lives, it can cause us to miss out on the God blessing and the God future that He has for us. And I'm here to warn us today that we cannot allow disappointment to set in. See, when disappointment settles in, it's handled the wrong way, it causes us to isolate ourselves, to lose our fruitfulness, to lose our kingdom impact. It can sabotage us from stepping in to all that God has for us. It gives fear power in our lives because we're always looking for the way it could go wrong rather than the possibilities of what God could do. It breeds a spirit of bitterness because it's everyone else's fault rather than us taking ownership of our future and going, you know what, I'm still gonna believe in God's promises. It subtly chips away at us and it holds us in a pattern of settling rather than believing for greater. See, we are the ones that are responsible for what we are cultivating in our lives. There is no 
excuse for not living out our God call. It does not matter what has happened to us in life, how people have treated us, what has gone on. We are the ones responsible for cultivating the God call. I grew up when I was younger on a dairy farm, and I still remember at the young age just going out with my brothers, and we had shovels, and, you know, way back in farming days, there was no, safety wasn't really a concern, and just shoveling away, and we were sent out to get, to get weeds, to, to take out the thistles. I remember one day in particular, I missed a thistle, and just the, the shovel went up and just grazed my brother's eyebrow. Just, it was so close. Blood was pouring everywhere. I remember crying back to mum and dad, and they're like, okay, you won't be doing that again. But we were just on this mission to get rid of weeds, because we knew as farmers that you had to cultivate the good and get rid of the bad. And it's the same in our lives today. See, weeds in our lives are simply seeds that go unaddressed. Bad seeds that go unaddressed. And we have to be responsible for what we cultivate in our lives. Are we cultivating things that are going to take territory where good should be grown instead? Because that's what happens when disappointment sets in. It takes over our lives and we're no longer fruitful. We don't have the kingdom impact that we can have. Hebrews 12 verse 15 says, See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. You have influence wherever we are. Let's make sure stuff isn't getting into our spirit, into our soul that's going to cause trouble, not just for us, but others around us as well. We're cultivating what is godly, what is kingdom focused, what is going to cause fruitfulness and growth in our lives. So what I want to do today is look at how to process disappointment. How do we do it? Because it's a very real reality in our lives. How do we process disappointment? Online, are you with me? I'm sure you are. The first thing we do is that we've got to anchor our hope to God and not an outcome. Anchor our hope to God and not an outcome. See, the dictionary definition of disappointment is sadness or displeasure caused by the non-fulfillment of one's hopes or expectations. See, we are wired to have hope, to have expectation. God has wired it like that. But he is also very clear where we are to place our hope. Ephesians 1 verse 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. We are called to have hope in a living God and nothing else, not hope in others, not hope in opportunity, not hope in what is going on around us, but hope in the character and the goodness and the trustworthiness of who our God is. Hope in a person that is Jesus Christ, that is the Holy Spirit being with us, not hope in an outcome. But so often we are about the outcome rather than embracing what God wants to do and how he wants to reveal himself in the middle of what we're going through. I love what Isaiah 49 verse 23 says, those who hope in me will not be disappointed. He is secure he is the place where we can always get our hope from. See, when we have expectations in God, those are good expectations to have. When we put our expectations in other people, other things, other opportunities, we're always going to be let down. But when we put our expectations in God, they are good. See, we can expect God to never leave us nor forsake us. We can expect God to renew our strength as we put our trust in Him. We can expect to upgrade our anxiety for peace when we pray to God and give Him thanks and trust Him. We can expect God to direct our lives as we trust Him and rely on Him. We can expect God to give divine wisdom when we ask for help. We can expect God to never, ever let us down. We can expect Him to work the miraculous. We can expect Him to show His power through us. Come on, where are our expectations being placed? Because we've got to make sure our expectations are in the character and the living presence of who our God is. And man, I was reminded about this again when we were in lockdown and the kids had 
all gone to bed for the night and Craig and I were just chatting in front of the TV. I was giving him a bit of a back rub and he loves those back scratches. I don't do it enough. But... And as we were just chatting away, he said to me, hey, babe, you know, I got some news today and I don't want you to freak out about this. So immediately I'm like freaking out. He's like, look, we've just been given notice today as a church that we've got to get out of our building. And so, you know, you're in those moments where you already feel separated from church because all you're doing is online. You already feel quite vulnerable. And then you hear the news that we've got to get out of our building. And by March, that was the news as well. And it's one of those moments of going, okay, I can go to my natural man right now, my natural person, or I can go to God and go, okay, God, how do you want me to deal with this? What are you saying in the middle of this? And so I went to my Bible and straight away, I opened it up to Mark 10. It's the story of blind Bartimaeus receiving healing from Jesus. And he cries out to Jesus, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And it's actually the first public declaration that Jesus is the Messiah because he gives Jesus the title, son of David, Messiah, the, the saviour that we've been waiting for, come and have mercy on me. It's the first public declaration of it. And I felt God saying that moment, in this, I want you to declare who I am in the middle of this. It's not about an outcome right now because I'm going, God, I didn't even know how to pray for this. And God's like, I don't, I, um, it's not about what you should pray right now. It's declare, declaring who I am, that I am the God of the miraculous in the middle of this, that I am your provider, that I am the one that is able, that I'm gonna to take you to the red sea where it looks like, God, there's no way here, but I'm going to part the Red Sea and I'm going to do the miraculous. You just wait and see. And there's this sense of where is my hope? Is it in an outcome? Because I need to know the path, God, where you're taking us and I need to know the black and white. I need to know it all, but no, I haven't got that right now. So I've just got to trust in who you are. Put my hope in you. Our hope, our foundation of our hope has got to be in who our God is. The second thing is dealing and processing with disappointment is we've got to look for the gold that's in the process. Look for the gold that's in the process. And as I was preparing for this, just prophetically, I really feel there's a number of people here today that you need to hear this. You're going through something at the moment and it looks left, right and centre like it's disappointing. But God's saying to you right now, you've got to look for the gold. You've got to look for what I want to do in the middle of you in the middle of this. There's something I'm doing behind the scenes that you can't see right now. But you've got to trust me that I'm going to bring out the best for you in the middle of this, that there's gold that he wants to bring out. And as a young girl, I used to work as a tour guide in, in gold mines. And one of the things that we would do is just show people how hard the rock was to get to the gold. Man, it was hard work for those miners, chipping away at that rock to get to the gold. You know, gold is formed in the hard places. God, uh, the gold that God wants to bring it out in us, it's formed in those hard times. And so often in our own humanity, in our own natural person, we want to run from the hard times. But we've got to learn to embrace them and go, okay, God, what is it that you want to teach me in this moment? What is it that you want to reveal to me? What is it that you want to speak to me? Because in the middle of this moment, you want to refine me. See, Romans 5 verse 3 to 4 says, we, all, we rejoice in our afflictions. Gosh, we've got to change our mindsets, change our perspective. We rejoice in afflictions because we know affliction produces endurance and endurance produces proven character and proven character produces hope. Hope is not just something that we get on a whim because we want it. No, it's proven through the hard times. Continuing to trust God when I don't understand it all, when it does not make sense. Why, God? Why would you ask this of me? Why would you demand this of me? But I'm not going to ask those questions because I'm trusting in who you are. I'm trusting that you're doing something far greater than what I can't see with my natural eye. But when we're just about the outcome Rather than the process, we miss what God wants to do in us. And I remember playing netball games a lot when I was in high school. I loved playing netball. And I remember getting to this place where it was, uh, I was one of the junior members in one of the top teams. And 
I would end at a lot of games just out of frustration, feeling like I hadn't played that well, been benched. And one night in particular, I remember coming home and just cleaning all of mum's cupboards because I was so frustrated. And if I couldn't perform on the netball field, well, I was sure going to perform with those cupboards. And just, I remember this sense of frustration, like, what do I do about this? And I remember having this moment of, you know what? I can just keep being frustrated or I can do something about this. So I went to my coach and I'm like, okay, coach, what do I need to do better? After every game, I would sit with her. What do I need to do better? How do I need to improve? And it was the most improvement that I've ever had as a player because I decided rather than sitting with the frustration, I would do something about it. And it's the same with us in life. Do we just sit with our frustrations or do we go to God and go, okay, God, what are you wanting to reveal to me here? What are you wanting to show me? What is it that you want to do in me that's going to take me to the next level? See, the thing is what we often do is we just go round and round in circles because we don't deal with what God wants to deal with in our lives. Because, and then we just go from one frustration to the next frustration rather than realizing, hey, there's something that God is doing behind the scenes that's going to set me up for the next season. If I would just accept what's going on, embrace the process rather than just demanding an outcome. Mom, what are we doing with the season that God has got us in? We can just go from one frustrating work situation to the next, constantly disappointed, looking for a better boss, better opportunities, better colleagues. If we don't see that God is actually wanting to teach us something in the middle of the frustration that's actually going to set us up for a win. We go from one argument to another argument with our spouse, get more and more disappointed because they don't seem to be changing and they won't listen. Rather than going, actually, God, what is it that you want to teach me in the middle of this frustration? How can I approach my spouse in a different way that's going to build our marriage rather than keep tearing it down? We go from one family interaction to the next family interaction, continue to be disappointed with with, with what's going on, frustrated. Rather than going to God and going, hey, God, what is it that I need to change? How do I be a light? How do I bring a shift here? So often we run from frustration or we just try and change the outcome rather than going, God, in the middle of this process, what is it that you're wanting to show me? God is wanting to bring out the gold in the middle of it. 1 Corinthians 3 says, verse 10, by the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, someone else building on it, but each one should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one that already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hail, straw, their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. It's in those hard times that we build with gold, that the gold comes out on the inside of us, that we know that we're building for eternity, that we're building for what truly matters. And just one of the things I would say is who we are processing our disappointment with so matters. See, we can be talking with people who will either ignite or extinguish our disappointment. People who ignite it, they sympathize with us. They get alongside us. They say, yeah, that's a shame. That should never have happened. And it breeds that sense in us that, yeah, I've been robbed. I've been wronged. And you know what? That ultimately, it doesn't actually grow us. It keeps us stuck. We need people around us that are going to help extinguish the disappointment and say, yeah, I get it. But you know what? There's greater. You've got to keep pressing in. You've got to keep trusting God. You've got to keep taking risks. Come on, who are we processing our disappointments with? We've got to make sure they're people that help extinguish the disappointment and help sow seeds in our lives that are going to bring about that God breath of purpose in the middle of it. One of Billy Graham's quotes is, learn from your disappointments and failures. With God's help, seek to overcome them. Ask yourself, could I have done anything to, to prevent this? Were my hopes and dreams unrealistic? Or were my motives wrong? Come on, who have we got people around us asking those kind of questions? Asking those hard things. Come on, are your motives wrong? How's the purity of your heart in the middle of this? Coming with those hard questions. And the last thing 
in dealing with disappointment, and this is a big one, is we've got to measure our expectation with God's expertise. Measure our expectation with God's expertise. Proverbs 13 verse 12 says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. The message version says, Unrelenting disappointment leaves your heart sick, but a good break can turn life around. So we're not meant to live with unrelenting disappointment. Disappointments are just meant to be seasonal. They're not meant to be where we find ourselves situated in, stuck in. It's not God's plan for our lives. So what we need to do then is every time we meet with a disappointment is actually measure that disappointment with the Word of God and expertise that God brings us. You know, for example, an area that we can be constantly disappointed in is people letting us down. We can be constantly disappointed by that because it's the nature of people. But God's Word actually says our expectation should be that people will let us down. I love what Colossians 3 verse 13 says, bear with each other. Forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And that word bear was originally forbear, which actually means politely or patiently restrain an impulse to do something. So it pretty much means when you want to slap someone, when they're annoying you so much that you just want to get out your hand and just give them an old slap. Give them the bird. Let a swear word fly. Just let out your frustration, the Bible's saying. Just hold back. Don't do it. Forgive. So what's the Bible saying? Get used to getting annoyed with each other. Get used to people not meeting your expectations. But come to me with it. Hold back, patiently restrain and forgive. Come on, are we meeting our expectations with the word of God? If you're feeling constantly disappointed because people don't acknowledge you, you don't feel seen, we've got to change our expectation to reflect God's expertise that says your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Come on, if you're feeling constantly disappointed because you don't achieve a position that you want, we've got to change our expectation to what God says. Matthew 23, the greatest among you will be your servant. If you feel like you're constantly disappointed because you may miss out because of choices that you're making, because you're choosing to stand for a godly life, change your expectation. God says to lose your life, you'll find it. Do our expectations line up with the Word of God? See, disappointments are incredible moments to allow God to line our heart to His to do heart reflection and go, you know what, God, what is it that you want to shift in me here that's going to align with how you see, with how you hear, with your perspective in the middle of this? See, Isaiah 49 verse 23 says, I am Yahweh. I will never disappoint those who entwine their hearts with mine. I will never disappoint those who align their hearts with mine who allow me to change our heart. Come on, the Bible says we've been given a heart of stone in our own humanity. We need God to change our heart daily. I just love this passage from Tim Keller. He says, the gospel, if it is really believed, removes neediness. The need to be constantly respected, appreciated and well regarded. The need to have everything in your life go well. The need to have power over others. All of these great deep needs continue to control you only because the concept of the glorious God delighting in you with all His being is just that, a concept and nothing more. Our hearts don't really believe it, so they operate in default mode. Paul is saying if you really want to change, you must let the Gospel teach you. That is to train, discipline, coach you over a period of time. You must let the gospel argue with you. You must let the gospel sink down deeply into your heart until it changes your motivation, your views, and your attitudes. How much are we allowing the Word of God to change our heart? Not just to think up here to change our heart, to change our attitude, to change our perspectives, to change how we see things. 
And we, when we go through seasons of disappointment, it's a brilliant time for God to do heart surgery. See, the incredible thing about our God is He doesn't just look at our disappointments and just go, we'll deal with it. No, He asks us to come to Him with it, to process it with Him. It's because every disappointment is an opportunity for God to do something greater on the inside of us. Because when we live above disappointment, it changes things for generations. It sets us up for kingdom impact, like nothing we could achieve on our own. When I was uh, 15, we had up till that point lived on a dairy farm. And my dad was a very successful dairy farmer. We were part of a church. Mum and dad were leading youth in our church at that time. And our church got to a place where it no longer had a building and a, a large commercial area came up for sale. And my dad felt God say to him, I want you to buy that commercial property and in part of it, put our church in to, to lease the building from you at a cheap rate. And so dad went ahead with the God word and he sold our dairy farm and we moved into town and he brought this commercial property. And to be honest, we were full of faith and expected, you know, God to just move in a really sovereign way, which he did, but it looked very different to what mum and dad expected. And to be honest, it was a season of real disappointment for dad in particular. He just felt like his identity had gone and there were disappointments that happened personally, disappointments that happened in church leadership. And I remember watching as this young girl, watching mum and dad go through that experience and just going, okay, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna see what God does here. And I just remember, I just so honour mum and dad looking back at that time because through it all, they just honoured God. I saw them press in to another level I still remember being woken up in the middle of the night with dad worshiping, just going into God's presence, going into that secret place, bringing to God his disappointment, and then staying in the same church, staying in the same building despite all the disappointments. Most people would have just been, okay, I'm out, I'm leaving the church. From our experience of pastoring, most people would have done it, but they chose to stay, they chose to be faithful. They chose to stand on God's Word that said He is building His church. So we're going to keep building His church despite what we're seeing right now. And then 25 years later, they still own that same building. They're still in the same church. And I have seen God bless what was a disappointment and turn it incredibly fruitful. And people wonder why they're blessed. It's because they handled a disappointing season with incredible integrity, with bringing it to Jesus, with being faithful in the middle of it, and look at what God has done. Five kids, we all love Jesus, all amazing careers. It's only God. Dad would say right now, he's one of the most successful men in the town. It's only God. But are we being faithful with every season that God is walking us through? Are we being faithful with the disappointments? Because see what I find? The rest of the team can join me, please. So often we allow our disappointments to taint our God conviction. Disappointments happen in church. So, you know, I'm not going to live with that full conviction that God's house is His home, that I'm called to build it. And we just let disappointment taint our convictions. Come on, we've got to live above our disappointments and trust in what God is doing. Philip Yangtze says, Faith means believing in advance what will only make sense in reverse. There is stuff that we're going to go through that only God knows. Only He sees the bigger picture. But we're responsible for what we cultivate in our heart in the middle of it. So I'd love us to stand to our feet. And we're just gonna have a moment right now where God can just do what He wants to do in the middle of us, our internal world, where He can speak. And you know, if there's disappointment there, that we can give it to God. He so handles our disappointment. He wants to work with us through it. 
we're just able to give Him our heart afresh and say, you know what? I want our relationship to be real, God. I give you every area of my life right now. And I know God's gonna meet every heart. So why don't we lift our hands to heaven? God, we just thank you so much for who you are. We thank you that you are our champion. That when we go through things that we cannot understand in our human strength and it feels like a disappointment, God, I thank you that you see it all, that you see the bigger picture, that you are working behind the scenes, that you wanna bring the gold out in us, that you want us to secure ourselves at your feet afresh, that God, you want us to meet our expectations with your expertise. And God, I pray right now that we'd abandon ourselves before you afresh. God, that as we hand you any of our disappointments, anything that's going on, God, that could take root and produce stuff in our lives that we don't wanna see grown. Father, we give you every area right now. And I pray that you do heart surgery right now. In Jesus' Name, Amen. Come on, let's worship Him. You are my champion. Giants fall when you stand undefeated. Every battle you've won. I am who you say I am. Me with confidence, I am seated in the heavenly place, undefeated with the one who has conquered. You are my champion, giants for when you stand undefeated. Every
Jesus, we thank You that You have conquered it all. That no matter what we face, no matter what we're going through that could cause any disappointment, You are far greater. And God, I just thank You for Your victory. I thank You that You are the one that is above it all. We just continue to trust in You, continue to place You higher. In Jesus' Name, Amen. You know, I know that there are people here today and if you're to be honest with your personal relationship with Jesus, you haven't yet made the decision to place your hope in Him to say, hey, I have an eternal hope in Jesus Christ. He has saved my soul. He has saved me from my sin, from my wrongs, from every all my brokenness, and He has redeemed me. If you can't say with confidence today that Jesus is my personal Saviour, then what we can do today right now in this moment is pray a prayer together. And that prayer gets your life right with Jesus. It says, hey God, I wanna start doing life with You right now. I believe that Jesus Christ came and died for my sin. Then He rose from the dead that I can have victory. Whatever I'm facing, I can have victory in You. That my hope is in You, not in my own ability, not in my own circumstance, but I'm placing my hope in a living God. So just why every eye is closed and heads are bowed right now. If you're saying today, you know what, I wanna place my hope in a living God, a God that is able to move above any circumstance, above every challenge that I face, then right now I just want you to lift your hand to heaven and say, hey, that's me today. I wanna put my living hope in Jesus. Awesome, fantastic. Who else are there saying, hey, today, that's me. I wanna say, Jesus, that you have my heart. I wanna start fantastic, awesome over there on the side. You have my heart. I want you to be my personal Saviour, the one I trust above all else, the one that I give my wrongs to, my heart to, that you are my Lord. Come on, I know there's just a few others here that join these three people that have put up their hands today. But who else is there? You say, hey, that's me today. Jesus, fantastic. What we're gonna do is we're gonna pray a prayer for all those that raise their hands, but we're gonna repeat it after me. Jesus, I invite you into my life. I ask you to be my hope to be my Lord, to be my Saviour. I'm sorry for my wrongs. I put my trust in You. I believe in You, Jesus. I believe that You rose from the dead. I believe that You have victory for me. I give You my life in Jesus' Name. Amen. Come on, why don't we give a hand to all those that made that decision. So, so good. And if you put up your hand, what we want you to do is fill out this card, just indicate the decision that you made today. You can put it into the drop box as you leave, or better still, head to our information desk and our team will give you one of these amazing Bibles so that you continue to find your hope in a living God. But have you heard it today? Have you heard it? For all those that made a decision online, you can click the raise hand button and we fill out that Live Connected card as well and we'll send one of those Bibles to you, which would be awesome. But come on, we are free to live without disappointment. Free to live in all that God has for us. And let's keep vigilant. Let's not let any disappointment get in because our God is far greater. We love you. Let's go have a blessed week. And we'll see you either tonight or next week. Mwah.